So I'm going to tell you about the Map v. Ohio case. Uh, Map was a woman in Ohio. Her home was searched. Police were looking for a fugitive. They didn't find the fugitive, but they did find evidence of obscene materials which violated the obscenity laws in Ohio at the time. Uh, they arrested her. She appealed to the Supreme Court on free expression First Amendment grounds. The Supreme Court ended up not deciding about the First Amendment, but instead decided to throw out the evidence that they found during the search under the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments. The Fourth Amendment, as you know, is a violation of search and seizure rules. They didn't have a warrant. And the Fourteenth Amendment is an Equal Protection Clause. That's one of the Reconstruction Amendments, which gave citizenship to freed slaves, but it also guaranteed all citizens equal protection under the law. And what that did is it applied the Bill of Rights to the states. Prior to the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights only applied to the national government. For example, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Congress cannot make an official national religion. But states had state churches, not all states, but many states had their own official state churches well into the 1800s, long after the Bill of Rights was written. It wasn't again until the 14th Amendment Reconstruction after the Civil War that the Bill of Rights was applied to states. And so the Supreme Court used the Fourth Amendment applied to the states under the 14th Amendment to exclude the evidence from being used against math. This was called the exclusionary rule. What it says is that if police do search without probable cause or without a warrant, any evidence they find will be excluded and cannot be used in court. Now, sometimes people will wonder, well, what if that means that you know a criminal is gonna go free just because of some technicality? Well, that is a risk. But the opposite risk is if we don't exclude evidence that was illegally obtained by the police, then the police have no incentive to not just search everything they wanna search. Why not search if there's no consequence? So there has to be a consequence for the police. Uh, this Map v. Ohio case and subsequent cases, what they do is tell police that if they search without a warrant or probable cause, the evidence will not be used in court and they might be responsible for letting a criminal get off uh, on a technicality. So that's the Map v. Ohio case. Remember the question uh, originally was First Amendment, but what the court actually decided was the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment and the exclusionary rule. Now let's discuss the case of Miranda v. Arizona. Uh, this case represents four different cases that were brought together, kind of like the Brown uh, case was actually five cases. Uh, the Miranda case was four cases uh, being brought together. And they revolved around the issue of police interrogations and whether or not they violated the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment, again, says you have the right to remain silent, to not testify against yourself, to not provide evidence against yourself. Well, this case uh, focused mostly on Ernesto Miranda, who March 13th, 1963, was arrested and brought to a police station where he was questioned by police in connection with a kidnapping and a rape. After two hours of investigation, the police finally got a written confession out of Miranda. The written confession was admitted into evidence at the trial, despite the objection of the defense attorney and the fact that the police officers admitted that they never told Miranda of his right to have an attorney present during his interrogation. Well, the jury found Miranda guilty. So Miranda appealed to the Supreme Court of Arizona, which affirmed his conviction. In other words, they said that the evidence was fine, the, the testimony could be used, his confession could be used against him. Uh, but then he went to the Supreme Court and appealed there. So the uh, constitutional question is, does the Fifth Amendment protection against self-incrimination or testifying against yourself extend to how the police interrogate and do the police have to tell you of your rights? Um, the decision was that the Fifth Amendment does require that law enforcement uh, or police officers tell you of your rights. They must tell you that you have the right to remain silent, that you have the right to an attorney, that anything you say can and will be used against you. So that was the final decision that police must in fact tell you of your rights. They can't just leave it to you to know your own rights. The Gideon v. Rainwright case of the Supreme Court revolved around the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Now remember, the 14th Amendment was a Reconstruction Amendment that made former slaves citizens, but it also guaranteed equal protection to all citizens. But then beyond that, it said that no citizen could be denied their rights or have their rights taken away without due process. Uh, 
In other words, the state cannot put you in jail without following the rules of a fair trial. That's what due process is, following the rules. Now Gideon, he was a man that only had an 8th grade education, and he was very poor. But then he was accused of breaking and entering, which was a felony. But he couldn't afford an attorney, so he went to court and he asked the judge to appoint an attorney to have the state pay for an attorney. But the judge denied that, saying that the state of Florida, where he was accused on trial, only provided attorneys if you were accused of something that could lead to the death penalty. Well, Gideon ended up having to act as his own attorney, and he was found guilty and sentenced to five years in prison. He then appealed that decision to the Florida Supreme Court, but the Florida Supreme Court rejected his appeal. So then he appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, saying that his Sixth Amendment rights to a fair trial were being violated. The Sixth Amendment uh, says, among other things, that everyone accused of a crime has the right to a speedy trial, has a right to a jury, and also they have the right to know the evidence against them, to um, interview witnesses, but also they have the right to be assisted by an attorney. So Gideon was saying that he had a right to an attorney. Now the state of Florida argued that he had the right to get an attorney, but he had to pay for it on his own. Because Gideon was convicted in serving time in prison, he was still acting as his own attorney when he appealed to the Supreme Court. He actually had to handwrite his appeal. And that's not really uncommon at all for people in prison working on their own appeals. But by the time his case actually got to the Supreme Court, there was an attorney who volunteered to represent him for free. In the end, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Gideon. And so today, everyone accused of a crime has the right to an attorney. And if they cannot afford one, the court will provide one. The Supreme Court declared the right to an attorney to be a fundamental right to the concept of justice. How can we say that we have a fair, impartial criminal justice system if poor people are denied an attorney just because they're poor? And so the court ordered states and the federal government to provide attorneys for those who can't afford one. Next, we're going to discuss the Baker v. Carr case. In this case, Baker was a voter in an urban or heavily populated area of Tennessee. He sued Carr, the Tennessee Secretary of State, claiming that the state's map of representative districts violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. See, the state had, back in 1901, basically given one representative to each county, but the legislature was also supposed to redraw the district maps every 10 years. The problem was the state hadn't done that. So as urban areas grew, they still had just one representative, and as rural areas shrank in population, they still had one representative. So you can imagine a city of 1 million people with one representative and a rural farming area with 10,000 people that also has one representative. That would mean that 1 million people would get one vote in the legislature, while 10,000 rural voters would also get one vote in the legislature. That's a huge advantage for the rural voters. Each one of them effectively has more voting power than a sitting re city resident. And Baker claimed that this violated the Equal Protection Clause, uh, and the principle that each person gets equal representation. One issue the court had to decide before it even got to the 14th Amendment issue is whether the courts could get involved in a political issue. And what they meant by a political issue is an argument between Republicans and Democrats over where the legislature would draw lines for the district map. As a general rule, courts don't want to get involved in political arguments because that can make the courts seem political. And as we've discussed before, the courts want to seem impartial. But in this case, the Supreme Court decided that this isn't really a political issue because it was about whether the state was maintaining the constitutional principle of one person, one vote. And so the court ruled in favor of Baker, and it required the state to redraw the district maps to give equal representation to each district. Another case is Baker v. Carr. Baker was a resident of an urban area of Tennessee, and then Carr was the Secretary of State, and in this case was the defendant. Baker was suing because he lived in an urban area and was claiming that his representation was less than it should be. See, the problem was a 1901 law had required that the state redraw their district maps for representation every 10 years, but that hadn't been done in more than 50 years. So, over those 50 years, early 1900s, a lot of people were moving from the more rural areas into urban areas because of industrialization. 
And this resulted in a situation where the urban areas, which had larger populations, still had the same representation, same, same number of representatives that they had 50 years prior. Meanwhile, the less populated rural areas were still represented by the same number of representatives they had 50 years prior, even though their populations had been declining. So Baker sued, it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in uh, Baker's favor, saying that there should be a one person, one vote rule. In other words, that uh, representation should be based on population and that each representative should represent roughly the same number of people. And that wasn't what was happening in the 1950s in Tennessee. The uh, urban areas had far more people per representative, which meant that um, the voting power of the rural areas was overweighted because each person had more voting power because of the number of representatives they had.